everyone, my name is Kimberly and today I will be doing a book review and discussion on Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare. This book was so good! Oh my gosh, so many thoughts. I've got so many thoughts. So this video is pretty much going to be spoiler filled. So if you have not read this book and you are planning on reading it, please stop watching or watch at your own risk. <laughs> the children from the characters in the infernal devices so we have james and lucy herondale who are the children of will and tess and we also follow cordelia carstairs matthew fairchild thomas and christopher lightwood okay so this story starts off with lucy running around in the woods she's like 10 years old then she falls into a fairy trap and a boy helps her and she just assumes that this boy is a changeling which is I mean, it's obviously never what the character thinks it is. And then we fast forward back to the current time. We follow the Merry Thieves. The Merry Thieves is James Herondale, Matthew Fairchild, who is James's parabatai, and also Thomas Lightwood and Christopher Lightwood. So they're out in London um, and they encounter a demon. So in this particular time of the story, there has not been a lot of demon activity in London. So these kids grew up not really going out and fighting a lot of demons. Um, their patrols usually aren't as eventful. Okay, so James is in love with Grace Blackthorne, who is his neighbor in Idris. Every year the Herondale family would go to Idris to spend the summer there. And James will go and hang out with Grace Blackthorne. And that's how Grace and James built a relationship in which they have an understanding or they are dating but not dating. So at the beginning of the story, we're seeing a bunch of people moving to London. Um, Cordelia Carstairs, her brother Alistair and their mother Sona are moving to London. So Lucy and Cordelia can train together because they want to become a pair of a tie. Grace and Tatiana are moving to London. They have an extended stay. Will and Tessa are the head of the London Institute. So they throw this ball with the whole London enclave um, to welcome the car stairs on moving to London. So at this ball, James had not gone to Idris to see Grace and their letter got intercepted by her mother. So he's super anxious to see her. Um, and so he's dancing on the dance floor with Cordelia and then in walks Grace and he leaves her on the dance floor and she's just like stuck there because what, like she's in the middle of a dance floor with nobody and in swoops Matthew Fairchild. We also find at this ball that the boy that helped Lucy all those years ago in the forest is actually a ghost and he is Jesse Blackthorn. And she is the only one aside from Tatiana and Grace that can see him. So the next big thing that happens at the ball is James kind of turns into a shadow and he sees this other like demonic realm and he sees his cousin Barbara um something like reaches up and like pulls her leg down and she faints. Of course this story has such a large cast of characters that it's so confusing and it took me like 100 pages to even remember who everyone is and who's related to who, which eye color goes to who and who has what color hair. So it's it's super confusing. And it really helps if you've read The Infernal Devices because a lot of your information will stem from that. You don't have to, but it'll be so helpful. Okay, one thing I love is seeing James's relationship with Jem. Jem has helped James manage and control um, how James like moves becomes a shadow or sees like the shadow world. I love that Jem is still so much a part of James's life and even in Will and Tessa's life. There's that moment at the beginning where Will's parents die from the flu and then Jem comes and the three of them are just sitting on a, the couch and just crying and Will is just crying into Jem's shoulders. It's just I love that this is in the beginning because it reminds us how much we love these characters and how we see them change. 
Okay, so now we're at the picnic at the park and this picnic is for all the young shadow hunters and Cordelia comes and she's got this huge spread because she's trying to make friends because she has issues with her father. And of course she's still steaming at James. So she pulls him aside and is like, you should not have done that. And of course Grace comes and that's when Cordelia asks like, what's going on between you two? And he tells her that they have an understanding. So there is a demon attack that happens during the picnic and there's chaos everywhere and everyone's fighting. And I just want to point out that I feel like Lucy is kind of pushed to the side a lot, um, especially when it comes to fighting and action. But she was actually the first one to notice that something was wrong. She heard Cordelia beside her murmur to Matthew about how it seemed as if it might rain. A few dark clouds scudded across the sky, casting shadows across the silvery surface of the water. She caught her breath. She was imagining things. Surely the reflection of the clouds could not be getting thicker and darker. Cordelia, she whispered. Do you have Cortana? Cordelia looked puzzled. Yes, of course, under the blanket. Reach for it. Lucy rose to her feet, aware of Cordelia drying her shining gold blade without another question. She was about to call out when the lake water burst apart and a demon broke the surface. It's just a small moment where Lucy is the first one to really notice. And you know, there are so many other shadow hunters playing even closer to the lake, more experienced and older shadow hunters, but Lucy is the one that noticed it first. And I just love that for her. I just wanted to notice make a note. So during this demon attack, they find out that of course Barbara is hurt again and the Arotsis that they're putting on her skin isn't working. So there's this demon poison that they can't cure using Arotsis. So James turns into a shadow because he thinks that there may be a connection between his shadow realm and the real world and the demon attack. I love when James is trying to turn into a shadow and Matthew goes, nonsense, said Matthew, hopping up on a nearby occasional table. It was quite frail looking. The last time I saw you shocked was in the Iblis demon was sending Christopher love letters. And then Christopher goes, I have a dark charm. <laughs> I love that so much. I feel like Christopher had probably the least amount of character development in this book and I can't wait to see more from him because what we do know is that he is that mad inventor. He's super smart, has a dark charm. There's He also has another line later in this book where he is like, oh, men love women that they can save. So there's not much about him, but I am super interested in seeing more of him in the future books. So Anna Lightwood is one of my favorite characters. Anna is one of the first ones that is really welcoming to Cordelia. She invites her to tea. And Anna is genderqueer. I love her outfits. I love that she is still like super into fashion. And then she buys all these dresses for Cordelia. Anna is also one of the most perceptive characters in this book at least with this younger generation. She's like that older sister. I wish we saw more of her. I feel like she kind of disappeared for a good chunk of this book. She was in at the beginning and then in at the end, but not throughout. So I can't wait to see more of Anna, Anna and Ariadne. Um, I, oh, oh my gosh, Anna's Book of Conquests. I love that scene. That is like one of the best scenes for me. Anna flipped through the book. There were many pages and many names written in a bold, sprawling hand. Hmm, let me see. Catherine Alicia, Virginia. Very promising writer. You should look out for her work. Virginia Woolf. Love that. James, Marianne, Verna, Eugenia. Not my sister, Eugenia. Thomas nearly upended his cake. And then Anna just goes, oh, probably not. I love how she's not like, no, I would never try and seduce your sister. She's just like, oh, probably not not moving on moving on so funny and we know that something happened with Eugenia they keep mentioning it but then they never actually say what it is I don't know this may have been something that was um said in a novella or something that ha happened in a novella but I really want to know what it is I hope that we get to hear it because Eugenia is not a big character in this book she's kind of really on the sidelines okay this whole Pisces box thing 
why these kids these kids know everything that their parents went through these kids know that opening up a pisces box ruined will's life and they're here just like oh look it's gonna be different this time if we do it it'll be fine like no and then also why would they not tell their parents i get the whole well we can't say anything because we made a promise to ragnar fell which later on is kind of like that promise is just moot pretty much kids why see if they only had just told their parents what was going on they didn't have to mention ragnar fell by name but if they had just said anything so, like so many things would have gone so much smoother but i love that moment where they're like oh well we didn't really think this through there's actually a demon in this Pisces box and we need to kill this demon so we can use the box. So they decide to do it in the sanctuary and they open it up and they kill this demon. And then who walks in? In walks Magnus Bane. Magnus Bane is in the house. I was super bummed because I thought that Magnus was not going to be in this series because they kind of mentioned that, but he's here. He's here. And of course, He's, his appearance is catching shadow hunters doing something they're not supposed to be doing and he's just like do I do I really want to know what you're doing probably not Magnus only caught these shadow hunters doing something bad because he forgot to turn back his watch such a Magnus thing to do and I love that Matthew loves Magnus I cannot wait for this friendship love that Matthew was like oh you're here six hours early let's have tea and talk about waistcoats I need to see Matthew and Magnus go shopping. I need to see them drinking tea and talking about waistcoats. I need to see more of Matthew and Magnus. Okay, I can't believe that Grace asked James to marry her and get their marks stripped. Like for her, it's not a big deal. And for him, obviously, it's his whole life. And he says no, and she takes the bracelet back. Um, let's talk about this bracelet for a second. This bracelet that she made James get for her in their house in Idris. It was locked up. This bracelet is from his demon grandfather, who is a prince of hell. Remember the bracelet has an inscription, loyalty binds me. So we know that this bracelet has some power um, that binds James to Belial because he makes a point to say when James came into the demon dimension, he wasn't wearing it. And so there isn't a lot in the book, even if you pay really close attention to when this bracelet is mentioned or when Grace or Tatiana or Belial talks about it, we still don't really know the full extent of its powers. And that's something I'm sure in the next book we'll see more of. But Cassie Clare did put out some Tumblr posts talking a little bit more and answering questions about this bracelet. And in one of the posts, she says, James can't just take it off because the spell won't allow him to. The power of the bracelet is, in part, the way it forbids people from thinking about it. And he does think about taking it off in Chain of Iron and you'll see what happens. So obviously it's something bad. I did go back and look. Um, when Grace asks him after he won't marry her. So he does take it off himself and then he like gives it to her. So I don't know if they're like she has to be the one to suggest it where he'll do it. And then we also know that Grace has these like powers over only men where she can get them to fall in love with her and do whatever she wants. But she says in the book when she puts the bracelet back on him, which is a thing in and of itself. I'm just gonna assume that she has no choice but to put this bracelet back on him, but I, I hate it, I hate, I hate that she did. I never wanted to do this to you, she said, but she insisted, and he insisted, it had to be you. My mother made me her blade to cut every barrier raised against her, but your blood, his blood, is a barrier I cannot cut. I cannot bind you without his chain. And then she puts it on him. There's something with her power where it won't work over James unless he's wearing the bracelet. And it's probably because she's probably getting her powers from Belial. That's why like her powers don't work on James because um, James has his blood. So I don't know, it's really interesting. I can't wait to learn more about it. It answers a lot of questions as to why 
the other characters don't just like mention it or is like, why are you wearing Grace's bracelet again? We see that Cordelia obviously notices it, but then that's like the extent that it goes to. She, No one questions him wearing it. They might notice it and that's a part of this bracelet's powers. Okay, Lucy's powers, she can raise and command ghosts. That's like an awesome power. Going back to why don't you just tell someone about this, Lucy, she has these powers and out of everyone who would understand her powers, it would be James who has his own powers, her father who can also see ghosts, or even her mother who is a warlock and would understand. But Lucy doesn't say anything to anyone. I love the moment where Lucy raises like an army of the dead to get Cordelia out of the water after the fight on Briar's Bridge and Jesse's there and she thinks it's him but no it was her and that's when she really learns that she has this ability. I cannot wait to see more of her powers. I hope that she tells someone and I hope that we see it used for something epic or even seeing her hone this power and use it for something good in this story. I love that Christopher is really the one that finds the antidote for um, the demon poison. No one like expects him to and everyone's just like, oh, well, he's just like messing around. But then he actually is the one that discovers the antidote. Um, I love his mind. I can't wait to see more from him. His goal in life is to create something that makes just as much impact as a portal. So I hope we'll, we'll see that and I hope he is able to create something. Obviously, when James gets a letter from Jem to go to the Silent City but not say anything to anyone, like how does that not raise any red flags? Why would a silent brother keep secrets like this? Like that's just like, obviously it's a trap. It's always a trap. Why don't you know that it's a trap? So Lucy finds Jesse's body in the garden of Chiswick House and he he is like pretty much snow white encased in glass um in like a room that has no roof so jesse is pretty much just baking in the sun during the day which is like kind of gross i don't know what enchantment enchantments they have on him but at least put him in like a cellar or something why do you let him bake in the sun it's just weird just weird weird okay so james finally 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 goes um willingly into the demon realm the the realm that he sees when he turns into a shadow and he finds out that his father is belial one of the princes of hell belial's whole purpose is that he wants to possess james's body but he has to james has to be willing to let belial possess his body and belial says that he tried to possess tessa but tessa had ethereal the angel necklace that protected her so he was never able to do that obviously like this isn't his end game he doesn't just want to possess james's body i'm sure there's like a bigger more threatening plot that we'll see um, unfold in the next book which i'm so excited for james is in this demon realm and he is trying to fight belial James's bargain with Belial is that Belial has to destroy the Manicore Demon so the Manicore Demon can stop wreaking havoc and hurting the Shadow Hunters. And then in comes Cordelia. She cuts through with Cortana and she goes and pretty much saves James. She doesn't completely save James because James hones his powers and he destroys that world. So James like creates this like tornado of ash and whatever that world is made of and like destroys the manicore demon and then cordelia uses cortana and injures balial the silent brother's so like well he's injured so he'll be gone for like a century you won't have to deal with him but no we see that he is injured but he is still well enough to continue his evil plots with tatiana freaking grace has to put that bracelet back on james and James does more of her bidding, ends up burning down their house in Idris. And of course, Tatiana is trying to accuse James and Cordelia, Cordelia, dear old Cordelia. So Tatiana calls on Grace to testify against James and say that, yeah, James said that he was, he was the one that burned down the house. And Cordelia stands up and she's like, nope, he did not burn down the house because he was with me in my bedroom all night long. No! 
Why would you say that? There are so many other things that she could have said. Like, why did it have to be just her? She could have said, oh, well, James, Matthew, and I were together all night. Or like, James, Lucy, and I were together all night. But no, she said no. James was with me all night in my bedroom. <sighs> okay, it sets off this whole thing where Grace is then like, no, Cordelia is right. James didn't set the house on fire. And then, of course, James, being the gentleman that he is, proposes to Cordelia so she's not ruined. And she agrees. <laughs> But it's a sham marriage and they're like, well, it'll only be a year, you won't get divorced, and then you can find true love. So they're both in love and they're both going to pretend to not be in love. James was only just starting to realize his feelings for Cordelia when the bracelet was taken off and he was recognizing these feelings. But because the bracelet had, he had been wearing the bracelet for so long, he couldn't really understand the differences. Cordelia needs to cut this bracelet off of James with Cortana or something or like someone needs to figure this out. I'm sick of Grace. Grace needs to go. Grace right now is not redeemable in my eyes. The only way she could ever be redeemable is if she was completely under a spell and had no idea what she was doing this entire time. We also don't know too much about Grace's background. We know that she came from the Cartwright family because she was adopted by Tatiana. So maybe we'll hear more about her background and who she is and maybe what she is because we don't know. This book ends with the engagement party of James and Cordelia. Of course, we're like, oh, it's going to be nice, fun party. Nothing's going to happen. And then no, everything happens. We see Anna and Ariadne, they have a moment. Ariadne is healed and she is like, I heard you when you came in and spoke to me and I just needed to know that you loved me because I will fight for you. And I love that so much because I feel like Anna, so much of Anna is pursuing like women or pursuing other people that I love that Ariadne is the one that's going to pursue her because she deserves it. And I just, I, I can't wait to see more of them and to see Anna happy. We also get a Matthew and Magnus moment where Matthew is like, Matthew tells Magnus that, oh, it, it's a fake marriage. Like they're only going to be married for a year. And Magnus, in the book, it says that he stores this mystery in his mind to be solved later. And obviously, Herondale's are this whole like, they love once and so he's like this doesn't match up so Magnus already knows that something is up this is like the beginning of that seed of doubt we also see Alistair leave Charles for good that was such a bad relationship I'm so glad that Alistair leaves and I cannot wait to see more Alistair and Thomas moments I love that moment in Paris that they have together it's just like a couple of days but they have this bond and obviously Thomas throughout this book is like crushing on Alice there. I love that the epilogue of this book is Will and Tessa's wedding. At the end of Queen of Air and Darkness we see the um, wedding of Alec and Magnus and I remember Emma saying specifically this may be only the second time in history um, that there is a shadow hunter and warlock wedding so that is at the end of queen of air and darkness and then at the end of chain of gold we see the wedding of will and tess which is the first time in history that a shadow hunter and warlock has gotten married i just love the parallels i love how that was done okay let's talk about characters lucy herondale she is such a freaking badass i love that will's love of stories and reading it's translated through Lucy in her writing. I love her stories, The Beautiful Cordelia and The Cruel Prince James. I love those. Lucy is witty. She is fierce. And I just, I love her character. I love that she is always like butting in and wanting to be a part of things. Every time a demon is talking to James and it's like, you have the blood of the Prince of Hell in you. Lucy's over here like, well, I mean, he's my grandfather too. I, I'm, I have his blood too. And she's always just there. So I hope she gets a little bit more of the spotlight, more of the action in future books. Not that she doesn't, but more. Jesse Blackthorne at the end gives his last breath, which is in the locket and gives it to Lucy to give to James. I really wonder what his motivation was 
for that. Like he's giving up his life, not for Lucy, but for her brother. And at this point, I feel like Jesse doesn't even really know James. So why would he do that unless like he's just really a good person or James can't die and he knows that. If James lives, then Belial will have more power. And if Belial has power, then Belial can bring Jesse to life. So maybe that's why. Okay, so Grace has these powers too that haven't really been said, but we've seen it happen. We've seen her use her power over Matthew. Um, and so again, on Tumblr, one of the posts that Cassie answers um, someone's question, she says, Grace is not a siren, but Grace has a power that affects all men. It doesn't affect James because of Belial's blood, unless he's wearing the bracelet. Her powers don't come from the bracelet. The bracelet allows her to use her power on James. We're gonna see so much more of Grace using her power over James. And I wonder how that will be because Cordelia will always be around. We do see at the end of the book, Belial is like, well, as long as Cordelia and Cortana is around James, then he can't touch him. Cordelia is gonna be in trouble. He's gonna target Cordelia in the next book. I love Cordelia. I love her nickname Daisy and how she got it and how James is the one that gives it to her. And he's really the only one that calls her that. We do see Lucy call her Daisy sometimes, but it's mainly James. And I, I just love that little pet name. Oh, I love the time where James has that fever and Cordelia is there reading to him and she lays down next to him. And that is how it starts. Cordelia is definitely fearless. She's witty, she's fierce. I love that when Anna asks her, are you a muse? And she goes, no, I'm a hero and she is a warrior. I cannot wait to see Lucy and Cordelia's Parabatai ceremony. I hope it happens in the next book or at least we'll see them train more together. Um, I just, I love their friendship and I love seeing them together. Tatiana Lightwood, she needs to die. Like, I freaking hate her. She is the villain, but I feel like she's a villain that she isn't like the biggest threat. She is just stuck in her anger and her bitterness. We see her from all of her descriptions, her emotions, the way that she dresses, the same outfit that she wears that has blood from years and years ago. She is just frozen in time in her bitterness and resentment. And she always lives in these like empty houses that are running down. And obviously big, scary, rundown houses that are dirty in like every gothic novel is never a good sign. It's always that something bad is going to happen or something bad is amiss. We see that Tatiana is pretty cruel towards Grace. She keeps Grace from the world, from shadow hunters, from having relationships. And she even like physically abuses Grace. I really just want to see Grace stand up to her. I hope that that's a thing. That, okay, that may be a redeemable quality if Grace stands up against Tatiana or kills her. I'm, I'm cool with that too. <laughs> okay, let's talk about these character parallels. Of course, with their family names, we see similar traits throughout all of the different Shadowhunter series. We have James with his gold eyes and we know that Jace is like all gold. He is like a golden goddess and we he probably gets his eyes from James. Cordelia, like I said, is super fierce and she wields Cortana like a badass and Emma is those exact things. Okay, when I first was reading about Matthew, I just kept thinking that he reminded me of someone. He thinks he killed someone or like he like killed someone. He frequently visits downworlder haunts and drinks a ton. He's like a functioning alcoholic, but he's also still super charming. Who does that remind you of? I'm just like, Will? Will, is that you? Is this is this Will in Matthew form? It's pretty much Will. And I, I hope that Will has a hand in helping Matthew. Matthew needs a lot of help. Either Will can help him, or I really hope that Magnus will step in and really be that friend for, for Matthew. Cassie loves writing men who recite poetry. I ain't mad at it, but that's just like definitely something that I've noticed because Jace recites poetry, Jem recites things, Will of course, and now we're seeing James reciting poetry to Cordelia. 
Okay, let's talk about all of these family heirlooms that we've seen in other series pop up here. Um, we have obviously Cortana, um, and Cortana is going to play a really big role in this series, I feel, because there's something about Cortana um, where Balial is like afraid of it, or not afraid, but is wary of it. Cortana is pretty much its own character at this point. It can choose its own wielder and it's it can cut through anything. We see Livy's locket. Oh my gosh, when I first read the description of Jesse's locket, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Livy's locket. Remember when Tiberius climbed the pyres at the funeral to get the locket? So it's the gold locket with the circle of thorns, which is the black thorn family symbol. And I, how does it get there? I want to see, like, because now Lucy has the locket because Jesse gave it to Lucy. And the locket is no longer holding Jesse's last breath. So Lucy probably becomes a Blackthorn. And that is how that is passed down. We also see Izzy's red gem necklace. And it's worn by an equally badass woman, Anna. I love the continuation of the stories of these heirlooms and the characters that wear them. So far, I feel like everyone that has had an item has been worthy of it. We haven't seen, like remember when Cortana was taken by Zara and it's like, bro, why, why? I think it would be really interesting if we saw one of these family heirlooms worn by someone who is bad. So wrapping up my thoughts and some of the things that I'm looking forward to in the next book, Chain of Iron, um, overall, this group of friends, the Merry Thieves, including Cordelia and Lucy. This is probably my favorite group of friends because they all pretty much grew up together. They have this established relationship and it's, you know, it's really strong and I can't wait to see it grow even stronger. I love the different roles that they play in this friend group and I, I can't wait. And I wonder if maybe more people will be added to this group. I love how there is just so much acceptance of Anna um, and her being genderqueer and she dresses how she wants and her parents are just like, yeah, you know, we love you, you're cool. And I, I love seeing that because at this time that probably won't be as socially accepted in the mundane world. I think it's really interesting to see the struggle of alcoholism in Matthew um, because we, we do see a little bit of this with Will previously. But we know that Matthew's journey is not going to be pretty. It's going to be tough, but I believe that he will make it through. If you just think back to Jem's drug addiction with Yen Fen, it wasn't pretty. It was hard and we saw Jem struggle and we saw Will struggle. So with Matthew, I'm, I can't wait to see how he overcomes this, how he um, makes peace with himself. Um, I know that it's going to be tougher. It always gets more tough before it gets better. And we're definitely going to see that. We're going to see that with his relationship and his friends too. Some things I'm looking forward to is the development of James's powers and Lucy's powers. Now that James can't go into that realm, um, but he can still turn into shadows, I wonder if he's actually going to master it. Because we know that he was working with Jem to master this, but I feel like he hasn't mastered it yet. I feel like he has only just managed it. So I'm excited to see his growth with his power and of course Lucy's powers. Um, I'm looking forward to see more of the romance and the ships. Um, it's always going to get messy before everything settles down. We know that with Cassie, so I'm not expecting anything less. I'm really interested to see more of Cortana and Cordelia and how that fits into Belial's plans, how he's going to possibly target Cordelia or Cortana. Of course, in every series, we have Madness walk in on Shadow Hunters doing the dirty or having just finished doing the dirty. Um, I'm waiting for that to happen. It's gonna happen. It has to happen. And Elias is coming back. Cordelia's father is coming back. I really am interested to see how their family dynamic is gonna change who Elias is going to be. We know that Elias is the one that killed um, the demon that killed Jem's parents. Oh my gosh, you guys. I almost forgot the whispering room. The whispering room. <gasps> oh my God. Anna, James, Matthew, and Cordelia go to Hell Ruel 
So Anna can seduce Hypatia. They have to have a distraction. And so Cordelia goes up and does this really seductive sword dance, which everyone ends up loving. And Charles shows up. Charles is Matthew's older brother. And of course, Matthew was like, well, everyone expects this of me. You guys go hide. So James and Cordelia go into this room called the Whispering Room, and they end up having this hot makeup sesh. And at the end, oh, so stupid, because they're just like, oh, well, it was all fake. When obviously there was that connection, and they both wanted to make out. And Matthew was the one that walked in on them. I, I for sure thought that Magnus was going to be the one who had opened the door and been like, oh, because, you know, that always happens. Okay, some last things. I really love how Cassie writes friendships. I love how all of her friendships are just super heartfelt. They're so intense. And she writes friendships that I wish I had. And that's something in all of her books, all of the series, the different Shadowhunter series that I've really enjoyed. I love the complexities in each of their relationships and how they grow, um, how they struggle, and but ultimately come out stronger. Thanks for watching this video. Feel free to leave a comment below on some of your favorite moments or your favorite characters from this series thus far. Um, I can't wait for the next book. No, you can't either. So I'll see you next time. Bye.